It is. <laughs> Psalms 103. <laughs> 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 Psalms 103. <laughs> Yeah. Verse 20. Here we go. Praise the Lord, you his angels. You mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. You his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord. My soul. It's an admonition that David gives to himself and then others to stir themselves up to praise the Lord. He even admonishes the angels to praise the Lord. The mighty ones, which are basically the heavenly hosts, the army of God. And those who do his bidding, who obey his word. That's why I say that the word of God is so important because the Father releases his angels to bring about his word, which is his will. Okay? So when we speak the word of God, we then are allowing, it's not that he has to have it, but what ends up happening is the Father dispatches his angels on our behalf of the spoken word of God to go forth and begin to bring that to pass. It says this, You whose servants who do his will praise the Lord all his works everywhere in his dominion, which is the king's domain. As I said before, Psalms 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That means it all belongs to him. He summates it by saying, praise the Lord, my soul. Now, chapter uh, 104, verse 1, praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. So now he's talking about how God has clothed himself. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. How many of you know on the second day of creation, God said, let there be light? There's a separation there. Light came into being, and God is light. He then says in the text, He stretches out the heavens like a tent. Heavens, plural, rather than singular. There's more than one heaven. Like a tent, and lays its beams of His upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds His chariot, and rides on the wings of the wind. Look at verse 4. He makes winds, or angels, His messengers, flames of fire, his servants. So angels are the messengers. Both in the Hebrew and the Greek language, the word angel means messenger. They're always dispatched with messages. Now I want you to jump with me to the New Testament and go to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. There's a great debate on who wrote Hebrews, when it was written, to whom it was written. Obviously, it's just very Jewish in nature. And just let me say this, I really believe that we have transitioned, we're not under the legalism of the Old Testament. I don't believe we have to keep all the feasts of the Old Testament, I don't believe we need to blow the shofar, I don't believe we need to have the prayer shawl. Now if you want to do those things, fine, but they're not going to make you any holier or closer to God, okay? Yeah. So I just want you to understand that the writer writes specifically to the Jewish mindset and the Jewish people when he writes the book of Hebrews. He says in verse 1 of chapter 1, in the past, that means in the Old Testament, God spoke to our ancestors how through the prophets at many times and in various ways. That means through signs, wonders, through visions, through dreams. In fact, one of the things that we know, according to Acts chapter 2, that the language of the Holy Spirit in the time frame in which we live is the language of visions and dreams. You say, how do you know that? Acts 2 says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. I will give vision. I will, your old men will dream dreams. And your, no, excuse me. Your young men will dream dreams and your old men will have visions or vice versa. Amen. Go there and look at it. The bottom line is, is that visions and dreams is the language of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the ways that he reveals himself in this time frame. So there should be an expectation on all our parts. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you right now on all of our parts to at times have visions and dreams. Amen. That's right. It should be normalcy. It should be the norm. That's right. That's right. If you're a young man, well, let's make sure we got it right. I'm going to go to Acts 2. <laughs> young men get to dream dreams. Old men see visions or vice versa. Hey, you're confusing me, Joseph. <laughs> yeah. You're going to help, help, all right? 
Acts 2, verse 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. That means born-again believers. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. So the prophetic needs to be a normal part of any church life. Hello, I'll say it again. The prophetic needs to be the normal life of any church life. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. There it is. Any young men in the house? then you ought to be able to see some visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, plural, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So it becomes the normal part of church life. That's right. Amen. Okay? That's good word. Now going back to Hebrews chapter 1. He says in verse 2 of chapter 1, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. Everybody say, Jesus. Jesus. How do I know that large case, capital S, whom he appointed, note this, heir of all things. Heir of what things? Of all things, specifically sons and daughters. How do I know that? Psalms chapter 2, which is a messianic psalm, says, Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Jesus' inheritance is the nations. Amen. Through whom he also made the universe. How many of you know Jesus is the one that created the universe? That's right. Verse 3 now, the sun, large case again, is the radiance of God's glory, the, act, the exact representation of his being. So if anybody ever asks you, what does God look like? You just say, well, if you read about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll get a good idea of what Jesus is. You say, well, how do you know that? Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul also writes Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians 1, verse 15. Here's what he says. Everybody there? Still getting there? Here we go. I'm going to read it. It says this, the Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all, everybody say all, creation. In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's right. When John Mark, who was up here leading worship, was born, his labor was about 24 hours. So my wife's water broke. We're in bed. It's midnight. We're living in Roseburg. We just moved down there to pastor a dinky little church, had a church building, no people. Her water broke. Our doctors are all up here. So we get in the car and we drive to Eugene. It's in the middle of the night. We get here and we go to the hospital and nothing is happening. I mean, the, I mean, everything slows down. It's slow. They say, hey, you need to go home. We say, we can't go home. We live in Roseburg. We'll go to our friends or do whatever. So we go to our friends that we allowed us from college and they were older. They were from my hometown, and she was like an auntie to our son. And so we stayed there, and I'm rubbing my wife's back, and I'm massaging her. We went, we went to Lamaze. Anybody do Lamaze? It's a whole rigmarole. They teach you how to breathe. They teach you how to rub your wife's back and massage and all that and make them comfortable. My wife wasn't having any of it. I mean, by then, she was like <laughs> angry. <laughs> But anyway, we went through it. Finally, we went back. It took 24 hours until later in the afternoon when John Mark was there. We're in the delivery room, and I'm trying to do the Lamas, and I'm doing the ha ha he he ha ha My wife says, stop it. You're making me hyperventilate. It's like, I'm just trying to help you. I'm with you all the way in this thing, baby, and, and it ain't working. And so it was all natural until push, came to, push comes to shove, and my wife says, just knock me out. <laughs> knock me out. I mean, ladies, you know what we're talking about, the pain's intense. And so John Mark is in the birth canal a long, long time. So finally he's born and he's delivered, and it's well over a 24-hour period of time. And this dude, he's done, delivered. We clean him up, and they take him to the little, you know, the nursery where they're in incubation things, and they're sitting in there. And so I leave my wife, and I says, well, I'm going to go get something to eat. And so what do I do? Rather than eat, I walk down, and I look at my son, my brand-new baby boy. He's laying there behind the glass in his little thing. And I'm looking at him, and they put a little guy's hat on him. For the guys, it was blue. For the girls, it was pink. Okay, he's in there, and I'm noticing his hat falls off. 
And because she pushed so hard and the birth was so long, my son had a cone head. He was not the exact representation of his daddy. He was a cone head. And, man, I was nervous. I thought, man, is he going to stay that way? I was really embarrassed. I thought, you know, John Mark is going to be a cone head. And I, I, I finally, I, I get bold, and I go back in there, and I take his little hat that had fallen off, and I put it back on his head, and I, and I just stood there and watched, and I was amazed. And, of course, you know, babies' heads are soft, and they move, and they shape, and everything. You saw he has a nice round head. He's not a cone head. He's, you know, none of that. And, he, and, he, and it all worked out. It's all fine. But as he, as he got a little bit bigger, his features really are like mine. His hair coloring and everything's like his mom's, like Helen's. But he, both of my boys look a lot like me, and he, people look at him and say, yeah, your kids look like you, and so forth and so on. But when I look at Jesus, and it talks about him, it says that he is the image of the invisible God, and that when you see him, according to John 14, 9, you see the Father. Amen. That's right. So if we ever want to know what is the Father like, what is the heart of God, all you have to do is look at Jesus, his That's life, right. and his ministry. That's right. Go back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. It says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He spoke and the world came into being. He spoke and it continues to be sustained. I mean, gravity, all of those things that are in place. After he had provided purification for sins, how did he do that? By the cross, through his death, burial, and resurrection. It says that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So that is where he is right now. If you're wondering, where is Jesus? What's his job description? He is the high priest. He sits at the right hand of the Father where he lives to make intercession on behalf of the saints. Say, I'm a saint. I'm a saint. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a, you're a saint. And so he's making intercession on our behalf. And so he became as much superior to the angels. And Everybody take a big yawn. Go like this. We got oxygen to everybody's brain. Now we weren't going to lose anybody in the in the journey here. <laughs> it's all right. If you get tired, I'll just throw something at you and if it'll wake you up. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so he provided purification through his blood. Everybody say his blood. His blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. It's the blood of Jesus that purifies us from our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Majesty, large case, meaning God the Father. So he became as much superior, note this, to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So even as the angels are powerful, have a job description, have a responsibility to do the Father's bidding, Jesus is superior to them. Now, going on in the text, verse number four. For to which of the angels did God ever say? Note the word angels again. You're my son. Today I become your father. It's a quote from Psalms 2, verse 7, which was just before, ask me and I'll give you the nations as an inheritance. Or again, I'll be his father and he'll be my son. It's a quote from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. If you have a footnote, it shows you right there. 1 Chronicles 7, 13. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. That's right. Deuteronomy 32, 43. Now, Helen and I have been privileged to be to Israel. I've been there a couple of times. And when you go to Bethlehem, which is five miles south of Jerusalem, on your tour bus, you go out to the angel fields. And you go to the spot where they believe is the very spot the angels had the lamb and the sheep folds at winter time for the reason actually is either probably more like about March was the time of the year that actually Jesus was born. You all knew that, right? Didn't shatter your earth that he wasn't born on the 25th of December. Okay. But the reason the sheep fold was there is because they always would have sheep in the pens getting ready for Passover season. They would butcher thousands of sheep in anticipation of Passover. Remember at twilight, they would then cut the throat of the animal. Can you imagine the blood that flowed? And when you read Edder, uh, Alfred Edersheim and his book on a historian regarding the Passover season, and literally thousands of Jews would come from all over at the particular time because it was one of the three major feasts that every Israelite was to come and participate in. 
that as they were slaughtering the sheep, the blood would be everywhere. Their feet would be in the blood. Can I tell you, the blood is huge in the Bible. Uh It's through the shedding of blood that we have our remission of sins. Can you say amen? Amen. There's something powerful about the blood of Jesus. It is. It's what saves us. It's what redeems us. That's why when when Isaiah prophesies it in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, he talks about the very fact that our there's the ransom for both our sins and our sicknesses in the blood. So they're in the sheep field, and it's that night that Jesus is born. And it says there are angels. They're out in the sheep fields, and they come down close to the earth. And they, this heavenly host, this great big heavenly host, think about it, in the field. They're out there in the field at night with the sheep, and they begin to sing, Glory to God in the highest Amen. on earth, peace and goodwill to mankind. The Savior is born to you in Bethlehem. His name is Jesus. He's the Savior of the world. Amen. Think of that. So the angels are declaring his name. They're worshiping him. And it says then, let the angels worship him. And speaking of angels, he says, see, I'm talking about this whole thing of angels. Angels, angels, angels. They are messengers. They're here tonight. I don't have to see them to know they're here. I know with the fact they're here. I know that you have an angel that surrounds you, that is around you. The, the Bible talks about suffer the, la- the, the little children to come to me for such is the kingdom of God. And it talks about even their angels that protect them and guard them. You think because you grew up you don't need an angel anymore? You, you need angels probably more now than you did then. And so my point is simply this. As you study the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, you'll find how often angelic occurrences were taking place. I believe they're the same today, that God wants us to see in the unseen realm. He wants us to begin to be able to see into that realm. And whether we see it or we sense it or we know it, because everybody senses the Lord on a different level. Some are feelers. We call those kinesthetic. That's the way you sense God. Some are those that, that hear the voice of the Lord. He speaks and you hear so when you prophesy you say I hear the Lord saying it's how I know how God speaks to you some of you say I see you have a seer's anointing there's an ability to see into that realm Uh you know we can we can we can operate on all levels and become attuned to that but my point is simply this the angelic have been released by the father to assist us in this day and in this hour to accomplish the purposes of God for the advancement of the kingdom of God can you say amen amen text goes on to say he makes his angels spirits now watch what happens verse 7 and speaking of angels he says he makes his angels spirits his servants flames of fire now that's a quote from psalms 103 4 which i just read a moment ago your throne O god will last how long everybody forever absolutely a scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Note this, his scepter is a scepter of justice. Every king has a scepter. It's what is extended. If you remember that in the particular time of certain times that in, in, in order to have access to the king, if you approach the king unannounced, specifically, we go back into D- King David and Solomon, in that particular time, if you came in or any other kings, one of the things that you came in unannounced, if they extended the scepter, your life would be spared. If they withdrew it, your life could be over. Because you were, came in uninvited. He carries a scepter of what? Justice. That justice will prevail. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your, above your companions. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions. Well, who is that? By anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, you did not know what I was going to teach on tonight, did you? And yet you got this dusty, musty old song that we used to sing from 100 years ago. You dredged it up. And that's all right. He gives us the what? Oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness. Amen. By anointing you with the oil of joy. Hold your finger there. Go to the book of Isaiah. Sixty-one. Anybody know this chapter? <clears throat> and I'm almost done. Yeah. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he is, the Lord has anointed me. Cairo is the Greek word. It means to smear. 
to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Note this, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. Here it is. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I mean, you know, we need to hear that sometimes. Amen. That's why David admonished himself first and foremost. He admonished others that were around him and even admonished the angels to praise the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. There's something about activating praise within you Amen. that stirs up and activates the graces Amen. and the gifts of God. Amen. You ever heard anybody say, well, you know, Tongues, it's the lowest of all gifts. It's the least of all gifts. You ever heard that said? Well, then you ought to start with it because it's triggering all the rest of the gifts. Have you ever noticed when you just began to speak with other tongues how things get ramped up and you begin to praise the Lord and magnify the Lord? And when you begin to praise and magnify the Lord, what ends up happening is as the Spirit of God comes, the gifts begin to be activated, stirred up, and made manifest. Amen. Amen. Here's what happens. Instead of a spirit of despair, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. You see, the deal is this. You turn your despair into joy, and then you become a planting, an oak of righteousness that becomes a display. You go on display. You go on display. And the display is to the glory of God, so that what you are then becomes a testimony of God's goodness, of God's grace, of God's power, of God's anointing that becomes a visible expression of his kingdom, his power, his glory, and his anointing. Hallelujah. The oil of joy instead of the spirit of heaviness. Come on, somebody. The oil of joy instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I think we ought to stand up. I think we ought to finish this meeting with praise.